Okay, so uh, today is March 15th. Um, it's 535. Um, and uh, this is the Public Safety Committee meeting um, that's being done exclusively remotely, virtually. Um, the We do have an agenda that includes uh, two minute, two meeting minutes, um, one of which one person, I, I think three of us were at one of the meetings and one of them, two of us were at the uh, meeting. So I'm not really sure where we'll go with that, Jared. But um, in the meantime, let's, uh, um, uh, I mean, I'm happy to make a motion to adopt the agenda um, and just need a second. Second. All those in favor of the agenda as presented, please say aye. 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 Um, opposed, we have an agenda. Um, not really, as I said, not really sure what to do about the, the meeting minutes. Maybe we'll wait for Jane. Um, and then we hopefully can vote on those. Thank you so much for doing them and getting them done so quickly. Um, we do have, uh, we do have a uh, public forum. Not sure if there are any attendees. There actually is an, an attendee. I don't know um, if the attendee would like to speak at public forum or is just here to, um, to attend. Um, if you raise your hand uh, and would like to speak, we're more than happy to have you speak. Or if you want to speak during the, um, you know, during the discussion on the CNA report, you're, you can put your, well, actually we have a hand up. So if you can just enable that microphone, um, that would be great, Jared. Hi, Jane. Hi, everybody. I just wanted to say I don't want to speak. I'm just interested in the work that the committee's doing. Thank you very much. Okay, thanks so much. Thanks for thanks for being here on such a lovely evening. Um, uh, all right, so uh, without um, any other members of the public, I um, guess we can move on to uh, the, we can close the public forum at uh, 537 and then get on to the discussion. Um, just for the benefit of um, Jane, just so you're aware of where we are, we're, um, we're doing sections four, five, and six of the CNA report, and you probably can access on board docs the um, most up-to-date version of the matrix. Um, uh, a number of members of the working group have been filling out their responses to the matrix uh, the chief has also done so, um, and there, ha there is a um, notes and response from the BPOA. Um, so the format that we tend to follow is um, talking about each recommendation one at a time, um, and then you can see on in cell on um, rows C and D or columns C and D, we try to come up with what we feel is a suggestive timeline in terms of prioritizing each of these recommendations and then um, the committee's conclusion. Um, you know, and if there's consensus, great. If there isn't, we try to express that in, the, in those cells. So that's sort of been our, our format. Um, so uh, the, first, um, the first item is in section four. Section four is all about use of force and officer-involved shootings. Um, and uh, the first, the first item is that the BPD should break out a weaponless force into multiple categories. Um, and it appeared to me from what the, particularly not only from the chief, but also from the two members of the police commission that that work is being done. Um, would you say that that is an accurate, um, particularly for the two members of the police commission, would you say that that is accurate? And as the, as commissioners, you feel that that is being done and reported on monthly? Uh, yes. Um, if, <clears throat> if you were to look at the use of force report summary that's um, provided with every monthly meeting, um, you'll see at the end of uh, the, at, at the end of every in incident, it does break down um, what type of use of force and uh, if it is weaponless. Maybe not to like this specific degree that the recommendation calls for, but if it is like an open hand um, 
use of force, it will say that in other types of uh, uses, uses of force. Okay. Um, so, you know, I wasn't really sure, and maybe others would know, when it talks about multiple categories, it sounds like they are doing multiple categories. The question is, when it says based on best practice and peer agency review, um, I wasn't really sure. I know for myself, I wasn't really sure how to respond to that, mostly because I didn't know what peer, what is best practice and peer agency review. Um, is there anyone that maybe could speak to that? The only comment that I would really make about it, um, just from uh, serving on the commission, the when I first started, we didn't even um, see something written. We things were described to us, so it has been a, a huge step forward that we now have a document. Of course, identifying information in terms of you know the name of a person. Um, is not included, but that we do have a written report that can now be viewed by the public um, and by commissioners as well um, was definitely a huge step. So it's, it sounds like there's fairly, you know, fairly universal agreement that, that this not only is a great, is has been a pretty big step forward, but also that um, you know, you're particularly the police commissioners are fairly satisfied that this is, um, this is being done and being done well. Um, I don't know if there is more room for improvement. Um, chief, I don't know if you know, as far as best practice, um, would you say in your opinion that what is being done is best practice? And if, if so, um, can you cite where that best practice might come from just so that we know? I don't know any other agency that does uh, what we do, which is every single use of force described and uh, released with demographic information about all participants. When I was in the New York City Police Department, I created a document uh, that was ultimately codified by city law um, that did all officer involved shootings. So every single uh, incident in which a firearm was discharged by a police officer in an instance other than at the range or into what are called loading unloading stations where you actually have a device where you can load and unload the firearm in a way that if an accidental discharge occurs, it doesn't hurt anybody. Any accidental discharge, any discharge against the dog, any discharge against a person, we covered that. We were the only police department in the country that did so at the time, but that was only for uh, officer-involved shootings. And we did not give narratives to every single one. Uh, we only gave narratives to every one in which a person was killed. Um, the department now does a larger use of force uh, that I did help to create at the very end of my tenure there. It too does not release every single incident. It aggregates them and gives a data representation of them. I know of, of no other police department that does what we currently do. And we intend to do more if and when I can identify a redaction specialist. I have sent the job description is posted. I've sent it both to UVM and to Champlain College and their film, their respective film programs, hoping to get someone who knows uh, how to use the various editing suites already, not Axon. We're never going to find somebody who already knows Axon unless we find a former you know, police officer or somebody who already works at a police department. But people who do know how to use the Adobe suites necessary to do certain kinds of uh, video editing, et cetera, and therefore have the familiarity necessary to do redaction. Again, we don't edit those videos, but we do redact them. Um, if we can get that, then I'm going to release, uh, as it says below in one of the other bullets, uh, a, a number of different kinds of uses of force uh, as per our agreement with the police commission, which include um, anything that involves OC spray or a conducted electrical weapon or lethal force or significant public attention uh, or serious bodily injury or death. And so, uh, and then once I understand what workload that is for the redaction specialist, it is my intention to explore releasing more kinds of incidents, uh, depending, again, it'll depend primarily on that workload. So um, if there is someone who, uh, you know, we'll, we'll expand it in a rational, logical way based on, on volume of incidents. But I would love it if we could release every single use of force and the body camera associated with it as well. 
And I know of no other agency that does that. And I okay. think uh, Director Durfee is on the attendees and may want to be promoted, Jared. Um, okay, anyway. thank you. Thanks for letting us know. Sorry, um, just to be clear on the notes. Um, so it sounds like we've made significant movement on this. We now have a document with additional information. So even though it maybe doesn't have categories per se, it says like weaponless force and then describes it and the police commission is satisfied with the current reporting. Is that accurate? Summary. Okay. I think I think yeah, so. so. Thing was yeah. Oh, my apologies. Didn't mean to speak over. No, you. go ahead. Sure. I was just going to uh, agree with that summary. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we don't need to put a timeline because we don't need a timeline. Um, and uh, um, thanks, Araya. Um, and I see Jane is is here with us as well. Um, Hi, Councilor, Councilor Stromberg. Um, thanks. Hey, Jane. Um, all right. So we'll move on to BPD investigating use of force incidents through thoroughly, uh, including reviewing um, body cam footage to better understand the reason for dispar disparities in Black community members. Um, and um, I think there was, you know, universal universal agreement that this was a priority um, from, from everyone. Um, uh, if I could maybe also say my comment just because I didn't send my thanks to Jared, um, which was this is being put under training. And I think that is diff, like the recommendation is around investigation and it was put into a training stock. And I'm also a little bit confused as to the agreement. There both seems to be uh, a belief that there is no actions on the part of BPD that's causing disparities, but also an agreement that we should understand the reason for the disparities. And I guess I think that's maybe the reason this went into the training bucket instead of the investigation bucket. So I think I think there's some inconsistencies at least between what the chief wrote and what the recommendation is and how we're talking about this. Okay. Um, I don't know, Chief, if you, do you have any, um, do you have a, a response to that? Not certain how this would be in the investigations bucket. Well, it says investigate. It says should investigate use of force incidents thoroughly, including reviewing footage to better understand um, the reason for the disparities. Now that, I'm not really sure, is that a training? I mean, if you're investigating, then you're investigating. If you are investigating to review, to better understand, um, that could be seen as training or review. I think more review than training. I, I wasn't wasn't really sure exactly what that meant um, either. So we, Maybe it's just a confusion. That's all. So we don't investigate use of force incidents unless the review indicates that there's been an impropriety. And the reason for that is that use of force is a legitimate part of policing and a necessary part of policing. And so the idea that you're going to investigate them thoroughly is, uh, in my mind, a misstatement from CNA and actually implies that there are improprieties where we don't know that there are. When we see incidents in which use of force was used improperly, we do investigate and open internals as necessary. But every use of force is not an internal or a complaint. So uh, that's why it's, it's use of force instructors who are also the use of force reviewers. And then training with regard to whether or not uh, force is being used in ways that are commensurate with training. Um, and then the need to do certain kinds of reviews with regard to body-worn camera footage, for example, um, again, the more of that footage we are able to release, then by necessity, the more of it is going to be reviewed. Uh, with regard to uh, searching for certain kinds of things in it, that is, a, for example, uh, you know, 
there are a number of companies that claim to be able to identify certain behaviors or uh, certain kinds of cues that may or may not indicate bias or may or not may or may not indicate uh, improper action. Um, and I don't know yet whether or not those claims are uh, accurate, verifiable, um, but I am willing to have an examination of, of the availability of that kind of technology and, and see what it can or can't do. Uh, that would also, have to, however, have to be done in accordance with, uh, with current directive and contract restrictions. So if we get to the point where we are releasing every single uh, body-worn video of a use of force, uh, then by definition, all of them are going to be reviewed. For the time being, they are reviewed when there are indications of, of, of something improper in the description or a complaint that comes from it or when there is injury or something that is a flag. And that includes some of the things that are listed in the agreement with the police commission about the incidents that we will initially uh, release publicly uh, as a baseline. Okay, Milo, thanks. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, Chief, when you have a moment, can you send me a copy of the job description for the Redactionist, I'd like to send that over to the media factory um, to see if there, I'm almost certain there's there's people over there that are able to do this because um, they, they train people to edit. So I'm wondering if some type of fee for service could be worked out, but I think it would be worth having a conversation with that organization. Um, with regards to um, what was just being discussed, this is a very, very difficult, very, very difficult. Um, sometimes what the department might consider to be an acceptable use of force is looked at differently, um, especially in terms of training opportunities for what could be done better. So it, we've had a lot of conversations in executive sessions about certain incidents where the department felt it was an acceptable um, use of force, but uh, some members of the commission felt that uh, felt differently. So that is one aspect to this. Uh, the other aspect is that um, I certainly have been vocal that I feel that the department can do more to be willing to look at why certain disparities are um, Occurring. So, for example, we've previously discussed the statistics around when um, firearms need to be um, drawn. And it's a huge statistics uh, when Black people are involved. Uh, I think it's 54%. Please correct me if I'm, I'm, I'm wrong on that, but it's a huge, huge statistics. And, and we were initially told that it was related to warrants. Um, only to find out that no, it's not actually related to warrants. So what exactly is it related to? Um, are we, you know, when, when questions are asked about, are we looking at use of force by officer um, in order to determine um, if there are particular issues with particular officers and if there are, what kind of circumstances uh, do we, does this officer find themselves in, right? Is this related to scheduling? Is it related to, um, you know, I've done some ride-alongs and I'm kind of curious as to when uh, certain officers uh, with their shift in the areas that they have to cover, but there hasn't been the willingness, I feel, in the department to do the work necessary to to continue to to lower these discrepancies. I, so I feel that, yes, we have training 
it's it's both to me that that is we want to be moving forward with training and tracking who's getting what training. And we want to investigate certain continued disparities so that they can be properly addressed. Um, yes, I, I, I think that's where I'll leave that. Thank you. Okay. Soraya? Yeah, um, just in response to um, the acting chief, um, the finding specifically for this recommendation is on using several metrics to understand disparities. Black community members are overrepresented in use of force incidents. They also experience higher levels of force as measured by the highest level of force used in an incident. So this isn't just, yes, use of force is legitimate. <laughs> and therefore we don't need to review it. This is specifically talking about, oh, our use of force has disparities in it. And so we need to do additional review of trying to understand why the disparities are there. So that's not a training problem, that's an investigation problem, which means that we need to do more to review footage to better understand why these disparities are there. And it sounds like that's something that we're not doing. So, I guess I I disagree with the assessment that we just need uh, training on this, um, but rather that we take a look at, okay, and again, I don't know if that's random or whatever else, but there is a coherent problem with our use of force that we are trying to resolve. Um, I'll leave it there, but I just agree with some of Milo's comments on looking at why it is higher levels of force as well as higher representation on use of force. You agree or you disagree? I agree. You agree. Um, so I know for myself, what I had said was that I agreed with the comment, mostly mostly to the because of the high priority and um, that we place, I think we all place on getting back to a place of trust build, building and accountability. Um, and this is a way to, um, to certainly increase that trust building and accountability. Um, I understand that, um, you know, what the acting chief is saying about, um, you know, about the fact that use of force incidences are, thir incidents are thoroughly investigated if there is a re if there is just so to speak a reason um but i'm wondering if maybe expanding that reason might be the way to approach this um and i'm not sure that every use of force incident needs to be go to the go through the same level of rigor um i i don't i don't know how much is involved with that process to know um but it would seem as though uh, a greater sense of rigor needs to be attended to some use of force incidents that is currently not. Um, and I'm not really sure how to, how to say that so that we can have some sort of conclusion. Is there anyone else who has an opinion um, uh, perspective on, on this? I don't know, um, Jabu, you see these use of force re um, incident reports how, how do you feel about um, you know are we doing are we doing enough are we being thorough enough um, is there a, a way that we can be more thorough without investigating every single use of force incident do we need to do that work um, um, <clears throat> I would also add to that um, I don't know if there would be a hang up contractually um, with this but this might be something to put into like the contract bucket uh, with regards to, because I know, I know we can't just audit any video. We need cause to, and I don't know if this would be, I mean, yeah, I don't know if this would fall, fall under that, but either way, I would like this kind of flag as like a possible contractual thing, just so we could, you know, look into other videos. If we, if we want to conduct a more thorough audit uh, on, on disparities, um, but with that being said, I do know that there was an incident that popped up uh, in the, uh, several months ago that 
wasn't flagged internally as something that uh that, that uh, as a overuse of force or like an improper use of force, but we it was something something it stuck out to the commission and we flagged it and we reviewed it and the rest of it went down executive session. But um, I I wish we could be more thorough on this. How we do that, I'm not sure how. But there, to what Milo said, we don't always see eye to eye on what is pro uh, an appropriate use of force. Um. Thank, thanks, Jabu. Um, so Zariah, Jeff, and Milo, I think in that order, I think, I don't know, did you have your hand up again, Zariah? Oh, no, I just failed to put it down. Okay, that's okay. Jeff, I think you were next. Yeah, no, I, I'm kind of in the same camp you are, Karen, I think. Um, I mean, I haven't seen the data that everybody's seen. So, you know, if there are the, the glaring disparities, obviously, we want to know about those. Um, but at the same time, I wouldn't want to have everybody micromanaging everything that the police department's doing. So I guess, I guess there's a kind of a fine line between those two things. So I'm, I'm not sure where I'm falling out, you know, weighing in on this one yet, but anyway, just thought I'd say it that way. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Milo. Hi, thank you. Um, I would just like to see the department take some extra steps. So I think I've mentioned um, this before, but I had a reporter send me a document, um, it's two pages, and they say, here, here's use of force by officer, what do you think about this? And I'm like, huh, that's pretty interesting. Where's this from? And it was from one of the depositions in the Mealy case. And I was like, yeah, it makes sense that the lawyers would ask for that. I'm like, can I see the whole deposition? And I've tried to get depositions and it's not an easy thing for an average person to do, but because I was denied being looked at that full deposition, I was like, well, I don't wanna comment then because I wanna see the whole context. And when I asked you know, the department for the information, I can't get that information. If I asked the department, uh, when I asked the department if they were looking at that information, right, because I'm thinking from an administrative standpoint that um, this would be something they want to look at to, to catch and act upon, didn't get an answer. So I do think there are things that can be done without, like, micromanaging. The, the data is there. The city statisticians said the data was there. Uh, the chief would just ha be, have to be willing to have that released, and the chief wasn't willing to do that. So I think that needs to be revisited um, so that we can uh, account for these disparities, and it needs to be part of uh, an overall strategy to improve um, relationship and trust within the community. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Milo. So, um, so Zariah, I think probably what is reasonable to say is that, um, uh, you know, keeping in mind um, any any rules, you know, any rules within the BPOA contract that that necessitate use use of force incidents being thoroughly investigated um, for cause that um, uh, that that it's it appears as though it's the consensus that uh, there should be a broader um, a broader definition of what use of force in incidences are investigated um, and um, that we need to work on how that on what the parameters are for that um, maybe the Maybe the parameter is a report from the chief on a monthly basis to the police commission and a determination by discussion and consensus um, with the commission as to what should be investigated um, so that we can um, better understand uh, the reason for these disparities. Okay, I have a little bit more than that in the <laughs> notes, um, but all I'm adding that as well. And then I guess I took it one step further to also highlight this as a contract 
issue and say that disparity is gender racial ability should be considered or sorry should be added to the contract as a reason for cause to review videos or i guess i should just say review use of force evidence right. use of force data jane are you okay with that yes i am okay great um uh, so in the, in the interest of moving forward, we've got um, these are these we've got a few more that are left on the use of for on use of force similar to the recommendation for traffic stops that BPD should consider. I think I've been around a computer too much today. Um, should consider the possibility of disparities are driven by bias um, and proactively um, address potential bias in officers' behavior or departmental practices by implementing training and reviewing BPD practices. Um, there seem to be overall significant agreement for that. Um, uh, and I think, I'm trying to remember if this was the one that uh, Hannah had put. All right. So, um, in Hannah's absence, one of the things that had been said, and maybe uh, the chief can respond to, is that um, what Hannah was saying was that they would like to better understand what current implicit bias training looks like um, since they come in many different forms. Also would like to know who implements these trainings and how, um, and is there an outside firm or is it internal? If you could give us some background on that, Chief. Uh, we've had a variety of trainings over the years. Uh, I mean, in excess of, of, of I think, three dozen uh, in the past uh, 15 years. Um, some of them have been internal. Some of them have been, uh, the majority of them have been externally provided by people who've been brought in, uh, people who are, uh, who have, uh, experience in the field, um, people who are vetted by sometimes by the state in some instances. Uh, coming up, we will be doing training with the uh, with uh, with racial equity, inclusion, and belonging. They are going to be doing, I believe, sixteen hours of training with uh, with BPD officers as well as other city employees. Um, and that including in, together with a review of the fair and impartial policing policy uh, will be the training that we do for calendar year 2022. In calendar year 2021, we uh, did uh, I believe 12 hours of iterative training um, with a trainer and also review of the fair and impartial policing uh, that was uh, for uh, both our own need and desire to exceed what's a minimum requirement by the state of Vermont, but the state of Vermont's minimum requirement according to rule 13 is that fair and impartial policing be trained on. They don't give a number or a time or an amount. Um, we've exceeded that uh, certainly in the last three years that I've been acting chief of police. Um, I don't know if anyone has anything else. I know for myself, what I had said was that, um, you know, I, I, I think there are, I mean, it, I think there has been 15 years of training. Obviously, there are different officers who have rotated, um, you know, has been have been part of those 15 years of training. It hasn't been the same group. Um, it, yes, ma'am. But for fair and impartial policing and the review of the fair and impartial policing practices and policies has to be done by everyone. It is a rule 13 requirement that every single level three certified police officer in the state of Vermont conduct that. So most of those trainings have been attended by all officers. There are certain exceptional ones that have been uh, only attended by a few. We did a, the city provided a training that had a lot of different city employees at it. I wanna say it was 2019. Um, uh, and that was, uh, I'd have to, to try to find it um, to remember the name of it, but there was three people that were brought in and did both uh, bias training, cultural competency training, and a certain amounts of anti-racist uh, in, in, uh, in familiarization. Um, 
that was one example. Another example is a cohort of, I want to say approximately 12 employees that were sent to uh, the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama, colloquially known as the Lynching Museum, uh, in order to do a facilitated uh, two or three day tour there. Um, with and the, at the at, there are two museums there, and I, I'm afraid I can't remember what each of them is called. One is the Legacy Museum. I can't recall the name of the other one. Uh, they are about uh, the civil rights history of Montgomery, but also of the country, and also the country's uh, poisonous history around lynching and other kinds of racial violence. That was something that officers did, and then brought back and uh, and shared those experiences with officers um, uh, with the rest of the employee base. So some of them are, are some officers, others are the entirety of the cohort. The state requires that we do certain amounts of training on this and we have routinely exceeded that. And then um, the upcoming RIB, REIB training will be all employees. I apologize for interrupting. That's all right, that's all right, that's on me. Um, the, um, uh, I mean, I, you know, personally, I didn't agree with that trip to, um, that trip that the officers took, I wasn't, wasn't really sure I understood that, but um, I think there has been a lot of training. Um, I think when, if if we if we you know as we know and certainly as the CNA report points out that there still are disparities. So obviously, um, you know, it's a persistent challenge, and um, still makes me wonder if perhaps there are other approaches that could be taken for the greatest impact and change. Um, Milo, go ahead, please. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to mention, because uh, we kind of previously discussed aspects of this, but just as a reminder, going forward, um, something that we haven't had in the past is like a definitive list of who attended what, when, and going forward uh, for the upcoming trainings through RAIB, um, even though it is every officer, you know, that that information is, is tracked more robustly than it has been in the past. Um, I also had, um, a document forwarded to me that I can forward to Hannah or everybody else that um, indicates what's going to be covered. Um, I think it will definitely be useful. I don't think it's enough. One of the very unique things about our area, Burlington and Winooski, um, and I can't say it often enough, we have a lot of problems related to the rapid diversification of our area. So we definitely need to continue to do more and some of the things that we do need to be out in the community, community interaction. Thank you. Go ahead, Soraya. Yeah, and I think both on the above item and on this item, I think, again, the focus needs to be as much on practices as it is on training, I think, in this bullet. Um, so... Obviously that review needs to happen first or at least in parallel, but I think we should also look at what changes and practices we can do as a department. Do you think to, you can put that, do you think you can put that in a, in a, in a, in a box? I think putting in the box. Um, there's a couple of things that we're going to get to that I think are probably going to be fairly straightforward. Um, the um, the the issue of when there are multiple responding officers uh, write accounts of the same incident, um, there should be policy um, and training instructions to make sure that those are done independently. It sounds to me like those that's already being done. Is there anyone who doesn't feel that's being done? I think that probably is something that um, we could probably, it sounds like we could probably have, uh, um, you know, support that that is, that that's already being, that that's, that's, that is just something that just simply needs to be monitored, but that, you know, and if there are other best practices that they can be incorporated, but effectively that is being done. Um, the, 
the next item is regarding use of force narrative in the following ways, and it's a pretty long one. Um, the uh, I think the bigger the biggest issue, the single biggest issue on this one, is the um, the issue of um, of the uh, obtaining a subject account. And I don't think that I necessarily took it the same way that maybe some other people do, which means probably I didn't understand it. Um, it, it, it sounds to me, at least from, uh, from the BPA's, BPOA's response, that, um, that it's not practical to do that. Um, and I'm wondering if there's, you know, if that tends to be the, what most people are feeling, that that's just not something that really can be done. Um, or if there is a way to incorporate that is that an attempt should be made, or is there no attempt that should be made because there are legal ramifications for that? Just wondering if anyone has an opinion about that so that we can come up with some sort of a committee or working group conclusion on that. I think I wrote that on my notes. Um, basically, say uh, kind of saying that uh, at least with, in terms of like the subject account one. I mean, like at least from my vantage point, bartending downtown, I've seen plenty of fights happen outside, and some of them happen right by the cops, and the cops will break up those fights as as they're going down. And so, I don't really understand how you'd do like a subject account uh, if you're stopping someone like in the act of assaulting somebody else. Why? what was their take on the use of force on them? At least that's kind of how I read the question, or sorry, read that uh, recommendation. I'm not sure if I'm all it differently, but I think at times like that, I don't see how that's really necessary. Does anyone yeah, have an opinion? Other? I'm sorry, go ahead, Milo. You know, I was thinking about those type of incidents, you know, because in the past, I, I, I certainly go downtown a lot and I've worked downtown I've seen those situations, but I've also seen other situations where um, I felt that a subject account would be helpful, at least from a, a training point. Um, and I'm actually curious with regards um, to the note that uh, included in the report should be any efforts at de-escalation. Is that already done? And if not, I think that that would be um, something that should be done. Thank you. Is that is that currently, is that being done, uh, Chief? I don't know if you can speak to that. Yeah, the, the reports that are these reports were initially read to the police commission. Um, in addition to be provide, in addition to being written, they are now made public online, uh, um, and they do include example. I'm sorry, Chief. Uh, apologize for confusion. This is specifically referencing what the officers write in their reports. Reports that are issued to the public are created by Deputy Chief Lebrecht based on officer reports. He cannot invent what the officers did or didn't do at the scene. So yes, okay, when there so, are so those reports don't really mention efforts of de-escalation. So that's why I was I was curious if that is a, a practice on the original reports from which DC Lebrec pulls from. They do at times mention efforts at de-escalation. Uh, with regard to these specific things, the reason I agree with the bullet is that incorporating some of these, uh, some of these ideas into, for example, a checklist for use of force document preparation Makes sense. Okay. 
All right. So maybe the maybe the way forward in terms of a conclusion is that um, you know there's general agreement for all of the for all of the bullet items. Um, the impracticality of a subject account um, makes makes that. Um, that a very that that's a real variable, and that there are in the in the moment or during the incident that that might be very or even immediately after that that might be very difficult to get um, and and just not you know not a not a practical thing. Um, I'm sorry. I go ahead. Oh, sorry. It's all right. Sorry, I, I just saw that Zariah and um, and Jeff have their hands up. Um, you know, I, Zariah, if you want to go, and then Jeff. I think Jeff was first, but okay. All right, you're on, Jeff. Um, so, as I'm sitting here listening and, and reading and, and thinking about you know all the things that go on downtown that that we're most concerned about, and you know mostly the. Uh, enforcement of quality of life um, ordinances and crimes down here. Um, you know, if, if I put myself in an officer's shoes and think about all of the reporting and all of the criteria and, and people looking over my shoulder, both, you know, publicly and, 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 and you know, just generally the public, why, why would I want to put myself in a position where I'm, you know, if I'm talking about alcohol consumption in City Hall Park at 1030 in the morning and, you know, the onlookers get right, at, you know, can get right in the way of things and it can get pretty messy quickly for an officer. I might not bother, you know, enforcing something because there's a, there's a lot of headaches and, and involved here. And, and so, you know, if we, if we put too many constraints on the officers, we, we they're not inclined to maybe enforce some of the things we'd like them to enforce. So I, I just caution everybody that we've got to, you know, sometimes let the officers do their job um, so that we can create a safe environment for everybody. Um, so those are my thoughts. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Um, I agree with, disagree with Jeff. I don't, I feel like I just heard we shouldn't, we're maybe discouraging officers from enforcing situations where it'll escalate to violence, which to me doesn't sound like a bad thing. Um, and then I guess my actual comment was um, just making sure that I'm capturing the notes and also going back to 4.3.1, which somehow I didn't capture is I think it's fine to not have so I guess what I'm hearing a say is to create a checklist new template with all these bullets as part of the report especially if it's not the exception may be a firsthand account from the person who use of force was used on I do agree with Milo that I think at times that could be really useful or would even be worth going back to especially if it's an isolated incident or something like that to and I think could even help build some kind of community trust if you go both back to any onlookers and to the subject themselves and are like this is why the use of force happened and these are our policies around it like do you have any questions or concerns and i don't think that's appropriate in all of them and i think it would be a lot of hassle but i think that there are cases where that could be helpful. So I don't think there needs to be a policy saying that is something we should do, but it may be something the department could consider as part of that trust building with the community. And then I had a question, sorry, I know this is longer, on the independently, which is just like to what extent there is, um, because I just read the chief's comments and it's just like, of course they write it independently. I guess I don't know what that means and to what extent like officers may still talk after the incident to be like, this is what happened as opposed to like just writing everything down from their own memory. Because we know memory can be really clouded and so getting it verified by somebody else. I just want to make sure that it is an explicit policy that 
people go off on their own without talking about it first on what they perceived to have happened. Well, that's a good point. Um, does that happen? How does that happen? How does that work? That is not an explicit policy. This is a recommendation that is a boilerplate recommendation that was not written with regard to what we're actually doing. It implies that officers are cutting and pasting each other's direct statements and basically writing the exact same statement, which does happen in some agencies. The idea of not being able to talk with other people on the scene is, uh, unless the officer is in a position of having been, for example, a victim uh, of, of a use of force or an assault, um, or uh, for uh, if that, or, or for example, if there is suspected malfeasance and, an, and a supervisor directs the officers, or in the event of uh, the use of deadly physical force, in which case the use of force policy for the state is very clear about what can and can't be done and when statements have to be made and under what circumstances. Uh, otherwise, uh, yes, officers are going to uh, talk sometimes about the, the nature of the encounter. They operate as team members and they uh, will work together as team members. But the idea of, uh, but they are not writing each other's reports, nor can they speak for what the others perceive. And they make very distinct uh, differences in that. There are no reports in which the officers are writing the same things. They're writing from their perception and their perspective. So I did not say that they shouldn't be talking during the incident. <laughs> I think that's a very different thing to be speaking during the incident and communicating when, of course, you're operating as a team. Then afterwards, I think it is better, especially, you know, with body cam footage not always showing everything. It is better. And I, I at least assume that this is what CNA meant is... Um, to get separate accounts of what folks think happened. And again, because we know how malleable memories are of incidences, even right after the incident happens, I think it's better to get independent accounts. So I don't think it's a wildly <laughs> wrong directive to say everybody write what they think happened according to their own memory and then see how different those are as opposed to everybody and not i'm not talking about copy pasting but everybody talking and saying this is what happened do we agree that this is what happened and then writing down what happened um before we get to before we get to milo um uh jared i know you had wanted to say something and also um uh hr director karen durfee has her hand up as well um so if you could enable that microphone um and then before we get to milo i know jared you had wanted to say something. My apologies for getting you uh, out of the queue. No need to apologize. It was my fault. I just was jumping the gun. But I I was just thinking of um, the, the Fifth Amendment at the time that we were talking about that and, and the right to remain silent and self-incrimination. And when you're trying to take victim statements or compel them to speak. I mean, there's a lot of rules around that and people's right to with, withhold their own perception of the incident in the moment, um, depending on what, what's going on and what they're, they're facing. So I guess that that's maybe something to consider as to why that wouldn't be so practical in terms of capturing that information right away. So what you're saying is that regardless of whether or not it's a BPOA issue in particular, in, in, in general, that it may very well be a Fifth Amendment issue. Correct. I think so. Okay. Um, I know that Karen was after, was after Milo and then um, uh, um, Detective Byrne, I know you, you have your hand up. Um, Milo, go ahead, please. Thank you. So I just wanted to um, go back to downtown for a moment. Um, there are some things that, and I've, Mr. Nick and I have had this conversation that they want the department to do that I don't believe are appropriate for sworn officers to do. Um, there are things, uh, downtown, like downtown will be greatly helped 
um, with the CSLs, downtown would be greatly helped with the cahoots model, uh, depending on how quickly we can get that up and running. I think downtown would be helped uh, by CSOs. I also have had issues with the signage or lack thereof downtown. Um, and it's kind of like a running joke with people when I describe that, hey, there's a sign that says that you can't do any number of things. The sign's not clearly visible. So it'd be kind of like a scavenger hunt. Go to City Hall Park and see if you can find that sign. So I think um, Church Street Marketplace Commission and the city are going to really have to think about if you don't want people doing certain things, yeah, maybe the signs aren't as quote unquote pretty, but there needs to be a legitimate, um, what I would consider to be an legitimate attempt to really make sure people can see that, for example, they're not allowed to drink in the city hall park. We shouldn't assume that people don't know that. I see uh, college kids drink in City Hall Park. I've seen tourists drink in City Hall Park, as well as other individuals that downtown merchants are um, concerned about. I mean, definitely there are people that are there early in the morning, and they they are. Um, they may be drunk. They it may be something else, right? Sometimes it's some of these individuals, I'm not necessarily sure it's it's alcohol or drugs. It's it just legitimately could be something else that would be uh, serviced better by uh, street team cahoots CSL. So, but I think we have to just be really honest about putting up signs, and then those signs are actually going to work as tools for say CSOs. I think that having a sworn officer going up confiscating alcohol at 10 30 in the morning is not the best use of of time uh, for for those officers i think we need them doing um other things um and of course if something's getting violent then yes they could be called but to just be confiscated I, I just i have a lot of problems with that um and i'll leave it there thank you very much hey thanks orin i know you um Oh, gosh, Karen, I don't know. You wanted to say something. Go ahead, Karen. Go ahead. I will defer to, I'll let uh, Oren go first. I think he had his hand up before me. I was having technical okay. difficulties. All right. Of course. I, love how every, I love how everyone else is self, is self monitoring. I greatly appreciate that. Oren, go ahead. I just, um, I just had a comment maybe to, to have clarify. Yeah. When, I'm, when I use force, I go back to the PD and I write my report by myself. And it's from my own perspective. That's how I was taught, and that's how I teach my trainees. It's not um, a group, a group project or anything like that. It's what I seen, uh, what I perceive those actions to be, and that's how I document how I document my use of force. And I believe that's broad current practice across the PD. Okay, thank you. Um, go ahead, Karen, and then I just we'll wanted... go. To Jeff. <clears throat> I'm sorry. No, I was just going to say, and then we'll go to Jeff. I know you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I, I, I was um, listening to Zariah. I, I was listening to what Jeff or Mr. Nick said about, you know, policing downtown. The fact is, um, and I think commissioners know this, um, you know, once a person is there to do their job from an HR standpoint, from an employee standpoint, you know, there's no, um, oh, you know, I, I might not be willing to do this job, you know, you know, it's, it's not, it's not exactly like if I'm a police officer, I might be unwilling to do my job if X, Y, and Z occur. Um, that's not the culture in the police department. Um, it, it may be, we, that's why we're discussing alternatives. Um, because if a police officer is there downtown and assigned downtown, um, they will do their jobs. So uh, I, I, I really wanna say this too in a public meeting, like this is a very difficult conversation that's happening nationally across the world. It's impacting our employees, our bargaining employees. And you know, I, it's very hard to sort of stay apolitical, especially when we're talking about disparities and whatnot. But I just wanna make it clear that um, once a police officer is assigned to something, that's, that's what they're doing. Um, they are not, I don't want any public person in the city thinking that Police officers go and just 
you know, this has been, this has come up many times and say, well, I'm not, I'm not, pur I'm purposely not going to do that. Um, that that's not what I have witnessed and seen. And I don't think that that's protocol. I mean, does it happen? I, I couldn't say, but I just want to clarify that because that's not, um, you know, I've heard this a lot from the public too. It's like, you know, they're not going to shy away from doing their job if in fact they're assigned for a downtown assignment. So it's, it's not, it's not something where they, they get there and say, well, this person is treating me a certain way. So I can't, you know, I, I I'm not going to, I'm not going to be doing this. They're going to be making judgment calls on what they're, what they're going to do. We, we hope they, <laughs> we know, we know that they're assigned to do so. So it's just not as, as fluid as, as, as folks may think where, um, you know, someone's yelling at me, so I can't do that. I don't know if you've ever seen the Howard Center respond to the treat, street team. I've seen people screaming at them and they stay focused and they stay right on the job. And that's what we, that's, that's what we really hope um, will happen across the board. CSOs, CSLs is really offering that, um, being able to run through that checklist. But, you know, I, so I just don't want to say about our employees that, you know, they, they may decide to do something that that's because I don't think that's I don't think it's fair. So thanks. OK, um, you know, we're going to you know, I think we all have our positions on how we feel about different things that go on downtown, different. You know, we, we certainly have perspectives, um, whether it's as a member of the police commission or a member of the Church Street Marketplace. We we sort of agreed at the beginning of this that we weren't going to we we, we know how we all feel and that we're gonna try our best to stick to the recommendations. So with that in mind, if you have anything else you wanna add, Jeff, um, please go ahead. Yeah, Karen, I know we're getting a little off topic, but um, just in, while we're talking about this, I'll make it brief. Um, you know, Milo and I have talked about these signs. I think we can bring out a more robust sign system out there. So the question then is if we do that and it's pretty clear that these are the do's and don'ts of downtown and City Hall Park and, and Church Street. And will then the police commission and the city council support the police in enforcing these quality of life crimes, including alcohol consumption, which leads to later in the day, belligerent behavior, fights, sexual harassment, it leads to a lot of bad things. So if we don't address it, we're going to continue to deal with these issues downtown. Um, and so we need to back up the officers. And I think, um, Karen, they do make judgment calls. That's what that's what it is. And so why why pour out the alcohol if they're not going to find the support of the city council and police commission when they do this? So I think what, what we're all asking for downtown is please let's focus on the quality of life crimes because things are getting out of hand down here and we need some help and we need the support of whatever law enforcement looks like moving forward. We need to have a robust enforcement program. Thank you. Uh, thanks. So uh, want, just, just for everyone's information, since we're all very interested in this, um, today is a bit of a milestone about an hour ago. The um, after a great deal of effort, um, the RFP for the CAHOOTS model has been posted on the city website as of just a little while ago. Um, the social service crisis team, um, it was issued today. There will be questions, clarifications, and comments due by Friday, um, April 1. Um, and every intention of moving forward with this by, um, you know, by the summer. Um, so we are moving forward with that, um, and uh, that's just sort of a, an aside. Um, getting back to this, I think we have, um, I know, Zorai, you're trying to fill in a little box here. Um, I think for 4.3.1, um, and this is also to some degree also based on Oren's um, input, that there, you know, that whether it's, I don't know if it's in one of the directives or if it's just simply the way that it has done, but that um, every effort should be made to assure that, um, you know, that accounts are done independently. And we have to, we have to trust our officers that when they say that they're doing that, that that is what they're doing. Um, as far as the other um, is concerned, it appears as though, um, it appears as though um, 
uh, writing a distinct report with a and obtaining a subject account is probably most of the time not practical. Um, and I think there's a difference between subject account and a bystander, um, which I, I probably to some degree took that took that second meaning when in fact a subject account is the person who is the um, perpetrator, I, th I think. Um, that's what it sounds like to me. Um, so, you know, if there is, you know, between us, between you and I and Jane, if there is consensus, at least that, um, uh, you know, we're supportive of the others um, and that, uh, you know, that, that if there, if it is possible to get um, a, a subject account that an effort should be made to do so, but that an officer is not under an obligation to do so, because it doesn't sound like that's really practical most of the time. And it would have to be left up to an officer's judgment to do that. Is that does that seem reasonable? Um, could I just get a clarification on that? Maybe the sure. be able to clarify, just so we are sure of what we're talking about, I guess, in terms of, yeah. Are you asking, are you asking what is a subject account? Yeah, just to make sure we're clear on that. And then also like what, yeah, what they're like going forward would be. Well, it seemed as though everyone else thought a subject account is the, is the, is the perpetrator. Is that, I mean, that, is that, it makes, it makes sense. I just, yeah, I like, I personally just have no clue. <laughs> so, um, you know, I mean, I, I, I guess obviously it's open to some level of interpretation. If we feel it's different then you know, obviously we need to say that, um, I think from my, my perspective, having talked it through, I think that that is what it means. Um, Soraya, how do you feel about that? So I didn't try to answer the question. Um, I, just to know, so people know what I wrote down, is BPD to create a checklist or update the template with all of these bullets as part of the report. The exception may be a subject who has recently had use of force on them both for practical and right to remain silent implications. We should err on the side of having a bystander account when possible. We will also allow use of force subject account if the officer's involved or their supervisor thinks it is a good idea for community engagement or in restorative justice. That sounds pretty good to me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks Not sure for how me. you captured all that, but that sounds pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Um. All right, so why don't we why don't we try to move on to there's a number of items 4.41 going all the way really to the end of this section that um, the chief has uh, deemed are done um, and um, I let's see uh, appears that um, doesn't appear as though there's a lot of uh, confusion about that. Um, I don't want. I don't mean to. I don't mean to gloss over them. Um, I know my suggest. My comments were the same for all of these because I feel like they're sort of the same, um, and because they all they are about the Directive Five, the statewide policy on police use of force, um, and it appears as though all of these these recommendations, these best practices, are being done. Um, Particularly from the point of view of the police commissioners that are here, do you do you feel that those are being done? Oh, Jabu, go ahead. Um, I was going to say that um, I think any anything that comes out of these next couple ones, uh, seeing it, we can't directly influence. Uh, we can't change the the state use of policy, but whatever we come out of whatever comes out of this for this section, I think we should just forward that to respective state legislative body that is in charge of writing and maintaining the state's force policy. Okay, so are you saying that, I mean, like, do you, I know in your comments, you agree, um, uh, oh, I guess that's what you said. Um,
Okay. Um, well, are there any of, you know, these are all sort of, as I say, sort of not one and the same, but they're all related to the same issue. Were there any items that, um, uh, that, that anyone disagreed with the chief's assessment that those are being done? Um, and I know there was one, um, Oren, where you had disagreed um, uh, with item 4.8.1, although the chief had said that this is being done. So I'm not really sure what the, I, I wasn't really sure quite what to make of that. If either of you have a, an under, just so that we can understand, um, how it is that the an officer would feel that they disagree, but the chief feels that's being done. The disagreement is probably because very thankfully we don't have very many uh, officer involved shootings. Um, but the report's recommendation to do an internal investigation and force officers to give statements before they leave shift is is um, for internal investigation purposes is is against good practice. By compelling an officer to give a statement, you're shielding, um, you're you're invoking what's called guarantee rights, and that statement can no longer be used against them in in trial. So it's, yeah, I don't I don't understand where the report was going with this. And I feel like this is in law enforcement circles. This is pretty well known, but yeah. So I I I disagree with making with compelling officers to give statements. You're you know, if there is if there is a a, a bad a bad um, shooting at, at Burnton that was unjustified, you know, a lot of those, a lot of the evidence is in officer statements, and now you just remove that as evidence that can be used to, you know, kind of hold people accountable. So, I I disagree with this. Okay, um, Chief, you you had said that this is already being done. Is that? That, that's that's the case. Statewide policy appendix A requires that all officers provide a public safety statement at the scene. Uh, and it uh, indicates that the officer, and by that it means the subject officer, must provide additional information to investigate, investigators. Okay. Uh, Milo? Uh, thank you. So, um... I agree with um, most of the DUNS because of the new statewide policy that uh, went in effect, which kind of overlapped with the completion of the report um, because the new policy went into effect during the fall. Um, I do have a concern with, oh goodness, hold on. Four point four point one. Um, police commissioners, we're not always allowed to view uh, camera footage. So, if that is something that is going to be allowed going forward, I guess I would like to see that updated to say going forward we would be allowed to review um, footage that we've requested to see. Okay. All right. Well, that certainly is a, that certainly I know is something that you have, the commission has wanted. So under 4.4.1, we would include that um, as part of the process um, that the commission would have uh, the ability to review the uh, a video of any use of force incident. Um, uh, as I, uh, counselor, as I've previously stated, the Commission has viewed use of force incidents. There are parts of incidents not the use of force that cannot be shared owing to issues around uh, what can and cannot be shared with non-law enforcement personnel. I'm hopeful that the city attorney's office will concur with this. We have never failed to provide footage of a requested use of force. Um, we have dealt 
with issues where we can't see all the available footage from say all the officers that are on a scene and that continues to uh concern me now has the issue come up recently no but because it's happened before it is a concern to me that it could happen again and that's why i would like to see the statement accurately reflect, you know, what, what has been the case? That is inaccurate. We have never failed to provide video from an officer who had footage of a use of force incident. We have uh, not been able to provide video that included witness statements or included other parts of ongoing criminal investigations, particularly when there are additional prohibitions on sharing it with non-law enforcement personnel. Okay, so because I can't talk about exec executive session material publicly, we're just going to have to agree to disagree on that. Thank you. Um, Jared, go ahead. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to, yeah, the chief pointed out, I, it's t I'll, every time that um, in my experience here at the city that there has been a request from police commission to see video they come to the city attorney's office we evaluate it based on state law etc um and it any video that is withheld is not because it's being an obstructionist we're trying to prevent things from being shared i i don't believe um but i do know that there is a desire for more body worn camera to be released to be seen i think efforts are being made and um those policies are being looked at too to see if we can expand it um, but again, the restriction of state law is something that the legislature would have to rewrite in order for us to permit certain things to be released at certain times. And, it, and that goes to, again, the litigation and things being carried out in courts and what we can and cannot release to people who don't have specific clearances. So, Well, maybe the... I was just going to say sorry. maybe the way to uh, go ahead, go ahead, Milo. I was just going to say, I do understand all of that. Um, and that was not the situation at the time. Um, and unfortunately at the time we didn't have um, representation from the city as attorney's office in all the meetings, the way we do now. So that was an issue. So maybe now having the presence of, continuing to have the presence of someone from the city attorney's office in all our meetings and executive sessions will prevent something like that from happening. But it is still um, an issue that that I have with regards to transparency. Thank you very much. And I, I'm, I know I'm not the only uh, commissioner with this concern. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I think maybe, Zariah, when it comes to that, that we just simply say that, you know, that that you know, I mean, obviously the police commission has come a long way. The police commission, you know, just three years ago was a different, a different body than it is now. Um, and a, uh, through, through many of their efforts, um, as well as um, many others. Um, so it would seem as though uh, maybe saying that, you know, body cam um, footage that, you know, that can be viewed to the fullest extent of, of the law um, maybe is the, is maybe the better way to put that. I mean, there, there probably are some, you know, I'm, I'm not familiar enough, but there probably are some issues under which that it, it can't be seen. Um, and we, you know, we have to honor the law, um, or work to change it. Um, so, uh, you know, it seems as though most of these uh, appear to be done. The only one that didn't was Sorry, quick question, Karen, before you go on. I put, sure. that under, I put this discussion under 4.9.1. Does that seem about yeah. right to folks, sir? Okay. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I think in general, Sarai, when we go and do the the, the committee, you know, the report, um, <laughs> um, which we're going to try to get done by the end of March, um, that there is there appears to be fairly universal agreement that given the statewide policy, that these 
issues, which the CNA report brought up, are being done. Um, and, and it sounds to me like they were in flux while the report was being written. So it's not as if that was the that's the take that I have on this is that some of these things have just recently come about. So, um, you know, no, no slight on the recommendations. And, you know, certainly, you know, things can be done at the same time, parallel to one another. So um, the only concern I have is just simply the last, not the last one, 4.9.2, which was about prioritizing the review including community review, revision, and development of relevant department policies, um, and providing updated training on use of force. Um, um, and I wasn't, I, I mean, that is a training issue. Um, it doesn't, it does say, it does appear as a statewide policy does take some of this into account. So I'm not sure where the partial agreement is on the chief's assessment. Um, that would be the only question I would have. I don't know, Chief, if you can speak to that of why you would partially agree. This is 4.9.2. Yes, uh, uh, thank you. Uh, as I said, it's I partially agree because some of this touches on the policy review and redraft described in section one. There's so many different policies and redraft, reviews and redrafts that were described in that section that some of this notion of prioritizing review of these policies, as it states, is, is beyond just the use of force policy and into certain investigatory policies, uh, training policies. And for example, in 4.9.1, it talks about uh, diminished capacity, which is a policy that the police commission is currently reviewing. So I agree, I partially agree with that in the sense of uh, working on all those things. I think that there are concerns about how community review is uh, is affected. Uh, that would be a component of the partial. Um, and then it's also partially agree because with regard to revision of the use of force, I can't agree with that. The state has a version. So it's a partial agreement. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Um, we can probably try to fill in some of those, some of those cells. Um, uh, I think we probably are in a pretty good place with that. Um, there's just a couple of items. Um, if everyone is comfortable with moving on, we can move on to sections five and six. There's only five recommendations together in sections five and six. Um, they're fairly, they're fairly short. Um, the, the, um, section five is about patrol operations, deployments, and traffic stops. There's three recommendations. Um, the first is that BPD should implement a traffic stop data system that captures in addition to the current information, um, the following, and there's a number of, a, a number of bullet points here. Um, reason for the stop, um, time, reason for a ticket and warning, passenger information officer, special assignment or task force, open comment field, um, and uh, um, that appears to be being done. I know from my from what I had said that I, I it sounds like that is being done. It still doesn't address the more critical aspect of the collection. Uh, you know, which is the implicit bias concern. Um, but I, it sounds to me like this work is being done. Is there anyone who feels that, that those, this information is not being collected or that more should be done according to the, in line with the recommendation? Okay, um, so I think the committee's conclusion um, would be that this this work this this work is being captured, um, and we don't need a, a suggested timeline because we are already doing it. Um, the um, the second is the uh, that 
BPD should conduct um, further analysis and review of body cam footage to understand these disparities in traffic stops and outcomes and address them. Um, and this again is a training issue, um, is identified as a training issue. Um, and uh, don't think that anyone had, it's hard to see this entire matrix in one view. Um, I think I have the same question problem again, which is, um, that this seems to jump to training without doing the analysis and review. The analysis of of the of the disparities in racial in, in traffic stops. Correct. You know, I, I know that I went on the um, the the portal and looked at the um, all of the traffic stops that stops that were done in nineteen and the ones that were done in twenty one. I didn't I didn't look at twenty because that was such an anomaly, um, and it appeared as though there had been improvement. Um, I don't think it was. It is fair to say that there are no disparities. I think that's a a significant overstatement and sort of sounds like something that's being that's already done. And I don't know that you can ever say that something like this is just done. Um, that's getting ahead of ourselves. That's to four point, that's to 5.2.2. Um, don't quite I, know how to how to how to how to accurately put that into a conclusion. Or recommendation in terms of, I mean, we can we can conclude something, but I think it's helpful if we can come up with some path forward, if we can. Oh, I mean, sorry, me, go ahead, Zariah. Sorry, yeah, I think for me it's the same thing as it is above. I do think that BPD has done a lot more in past years to address um, to address certain disparities specifically on traffic stops. So. Uh, um, my understanding is that they are lower, but I think again, to just go to training, if we're planning on addressing this, then either we say we've just deprioritized this because we have larger disparities elsewhere. So I would want some kind of assessment from the, like from the police department that says like, we have chosen these three areas to focus on in disparities. This may not be one of them, but um, unless we have that and are saying we're focusing on other areas of disparities right now, I would want to continue to see analysis and review, including again of like any body cam footage. Um, so I guess my ask here would be the same as on the other one is that the department comes back with some kind of strategy for addressing disparities across our data. And if they're saying traffic stops is just a lower disparity that we've already taken some of the low hanging fruit. So we're gonna focus on a different area right now. That's fine. But I think I want a more comprehensive assessment of disparities and how to address them. Again, the, with regard to the disparities in traffic, it is not a lower disparity. There is no disparity in the current traffic data. Now, there is a annual report coming out that is going to be a deeper dive into the data than uh, what I have done preliminarily for 2021. But for 2021, when we look at driving population as measured by crash data, we stop fewer black drivers than our members of the driver population, and we ticket black drivers less than that. All drivers, all, all stops result in a ticket only 20% of the time. 80% of all stops result in a warning. More stops result in warnings for black drivers than for white drivers. It used to be that that was not the case unless we only factored in drivers who were not suspended. That is no longer the case. We don't have to use a suspended license caveat. Black drivers are stopped less than they are part of the driving population as measured by crash data, and they are ticketed less than they are stopped. And as a rate, that is an absence of disparity. And there was no, there was zero searches of black drivers. Those numbers cannot be driven lower. So 
that is what I mean when I say there is no disparity in 2021 in this metric. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Sharon. Oh, I'm just confused as to, and admittedly, I read the, I'll let Mila go first. <laughs> um, I am going to forward some reporting uh, to Thomas to post to board docs because I believe it's relevant to this situation. I think at all times we have to continue to monitor trends. I know that there was, um, I think it was at one of the MPAs, this discussion came up before and there was uh, some additional documents that were provided. Um, so I'd like to, I'll forward that to everybody. And um, I think we should post it to board docs because I think it's it's important to look at. And I think um, it'll be when the next yearly report comes out and we've had a chance to review that, um, it may show some some different things, but I I just don't fully agree with that statement. Thank you. And I don't understand, like, I'm looking at the CNA report, which is saying the exact opposite of what the chief just said, which is that Black and Hispanic drivers are ticketed at a st statistically significant higher rate compared to the overall average. And that's the disparity that they're asking us to address. And then I'm also being told that isn't a disparity. It's actually the opposite. The CNA report, as do, as do local academic researchers, is using a span of time. I'm telling you that in 2021, the data is what I've stated it is. Again, I open the possibility that the deeper dive for the annual report may find uh, some stops or, or props, even a search, that are not captured in the data I am using. But preliminarily, the data has been clear for 2021, and we made that clear to CNA. Furthermore, that trend has been the trend for the past three years in that direction. Um, and the, uh, although in, in 2020, there was a, a, a change in, in driver stop where that number diverged in a way that was not what we wanted, uh, we had achieved we were hover, uh, the, the average percentage of driver, not the average, the annual percentage of drivers stopped in 2018 was 8% versus 75% of all drivers. That is of all, all driver of all drivers, 7.5% were black, 8% of stops were black. That is a slight, uh, a slight overstop. In 2019, it was 8.9% of stops were black drivers, whereas 8.4% of drivers were black. That too, a slight overstop. In 2020, it diverged quite a bit. It was 11.7% of uh, stops were black drivers, whereas 8% was their representation in the driving population. That was a big gap. That gap has reversed itself in 2021, and there is no disparity in the data for 2021. The population of drivers is 8%. The population of stops is 7.2%. With regard to tickets, only 5.6% of all tickets involve the black driver. So in other words, if 7.2% of all stops involve a black driver, which is less than their driving population, then 5.6% of all tickets involve a black driver, which is far less than 7.2%. That is an absence of a disparity according to those metrics. Again, they may be changed once a deeper dive is done. And with regard to searches, zero. It's not the first year we've had zero searches. We, I believe in 2019, there were zero searches of black drivers. That had been a real problem for the department with regard to an over-representation of searches, that black drivers were over-represented in the number of searches that were done. Those have been eliminated. The CNA report looks at a long time frame that goes, I believe, from 2012 through 2019. 2015 to 2020. That's good 2015 to know. 2015 okay. through 2020. Yeah. So I had also understood previous to this conversation that we've made significant pro progress on traffic things specifically. And so I think it, I, then I would be fine with the recommendation instead of saying training would be to continue to monitor stops, ticketing, and searches to ensure lack of disparity achieved and later years of CNA's overall data pool continue to be the case or something like that. 
I don't know how Karen and Jane and others feel about that. I mean, I'm I'm fine with that. I mean, I, the other thing that did that I did notice is just the the significant drop in the number of stops. Um, it's significant. It's not half. I think it was in the low one thousands, and it was. I, I can't remember now. I looked at the numbers this weekend, and I don't remember what they were. But I know that it was a significant drop. I don't it's, know. It's if eighty-nine. That it's eighty-seven percent, counselor. So from twenty sixteen, from twenty sixteen, uh, the the total drop from twenty sixteen through twenty twenty one is about eighty-seven uh, percent. There have been uh, so, and and of the stops, for example, in twenty twenty one, forty six were of black drivers. That's forty six total stops for twenty twenty one. It may be a little higher because I'm I'm looking at data from uh, very late November. But um, the, the, the total drop in stops is 87% from 2016 through 2021. And can I ask one of the questions? Sorry, Karen, I know it was actually sure. before. Sure. And then I know that we also had an issue with an increase in who, like not listing the race. Do you know if that's been addressed in this past year? Yeah, I don't believe that was, I think that that, uh, was a phenomenon in one report and not in the city reports. The city reports have not indicated that that is a, uh, an issue because the data that is taken from the, for the city reports that aren't conducted by this department anymore, they're conducted by INT, but the annual report in 2020, and I'm hopeful this year's annual report are going to suggest that that is not something that is uh, that's seen. So um, for these three items, and we, we, we have the answer on the first one that there is, that this is being done. Um, as far as the other um, two that um, perhaps, a, perhaps prioritizing those areas where there are the greatest uh, disparities would, would be the first priority. Um, and uh, that obviously this needs to be on, in you know an on ongoing monitored um that this need that, you know the fact that there has been a decline in traffic you know in disparities from uh 21 since 19 or even 18 not including 2020 since it was such an anomaly um um and that um that that would just be, you know, that you had said something about a deeper dive, that that would just simply be, uh, you know, uh, presented to the um, uh, the police commission. And in fact, I mean, I personally would like to see that come to the council in a, in a presentation so that it gains a wider audience as well. If we could do that during the, you know, after April of 20, 2022. Um, and I think we only, we have only two items left. Um, these were, um, about patrol operations to continue adjusting patrol assignments to determine resource allocation for mental health response. And I know for myself, that was, a the, the fact that the RFP did go out today does give me hope that we are looking at a uh, crisis response team in place by the summer. Um, I don't think there's really any, it didn't appear as though there was any disagreement about that. Um, and, um, and that, you know, obviously there would be the hope in terms of having recruitment and retention bonuses as well as the increase in headcount um, and a plan that the, I believe the chief is gonna be coming forward very soon in terms of recruitment, um, that hopefully there will be um, you know, more patrol staff in the year to come. Um, so I think we could probably add that as well. Um, it will not be in the year. It will be, this, it will be a multi-year process. Okay. Um, so, I think there, um, and then the other would be um, 
the last recommendation is developing a deeper socioeconomic um, bias analysis by area that includes a review of type of incidents, response times, um, et cetera. Um, uh, um, and I think that was, you know, I, I, I think that was more just simply whether or not it, how much of a priority we can make that for the de uh, Department of um, Innovation, the I, I, you know, IT. Um, it didn't appear to be as much of a priority. I think maybe on the suggested timeline, that would be something that we could put ourselves into either the end of this year or the beginning of next. Um, Karen, I have to admit that I didn't read the section because I thought we were just doing four and five. Um, it's okay. There's only two. <laughs> great. So I might have comments on this next time as well. Okay. All right. I mean, we can we can certainly go over those um, at the beginning of our at the beginning of our next meeting. Um, we'll try to get through. Um, I think there are there aren't that many. There's two, four, six, eight, ten. There's only 12, 13 in section seven. Um, section eight is, is a long one. So I don't know if maybe what we can do for next time is um, revisit section six, the, the two items that we have, and then go into section seven. Um, and perhaps begin a little bit of section eight. That was sort of my plan so that we could get through section eight um, at the last meeting. Um, you know, and we'll try to do that. Um, I would um, just as a friendly reminder, just, just once again state that we all know what our positions are on a number of these items and try our best to not only self-monitor where we are in the queue, but also self-monitor, you know, you know, re re repeating ourselves. Um, uh, it looks like we are in a pretty good place to stop at 7.17 um, before 7.30. It is dark outside. Sorry about that. I thought I was going to be able to make it before it got dark. Jabu, you probably have a you probably want to talk about the police commission meeting, so go ahead. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, I just wanted to know what time were we starting this meeting for next week? Uh, our, our meeting tentatively next week starts at six o'clock. Um, minimal to starting at touch later, but not terribly later for the other for the non bartenders on the commission who like to go to bed early. So, yeah, um, I guess we could maybe hash that out either now or it's like next day or two. I, I'd be very grateful. No, we can we can we can figure that out. I mean, we're all here, so why don't we try to figure that out? Um, you normally start at six. Mm -hmm. I think last I think last time uh, originally we were going to do it start at six thirty. It started going a little bit earlier, but we ended up not doing that due to President's Day weekend, I believe. So, right, right. Um, well, because we had a we had a council meeting on that Tuesday, so oh, yeah, sorry, we couldn't. Right. Yeah, so we couldn't meet. Um, so, um, well, you know, if people feel that we could start at five, then we'll start at five, which would maybe make it so that you could start at like 630, um, mm -hmm. 645, something like that. Um, I know Jared has his hand up as well. So maybe you have another thought on that. I am happy to start at five if that works for everybody. I just kindly wanted to remind the chair that we, postpone the minutes so if we could circle back before the meeting oh over. yeah yeah right <laughs> sorry right thanks for thanks for reminding me um yeah we could we could certainly do that i don't know is five is five something that people can do yes okay milo can you do that uh yeah, next week yes i can okay all right um chief Oren, is that going to work for you five o'clock it works for me. Okay. Yes. Okay. Excellent. Um, all right. Um, yeah, we'll get on to the minutes. The other thing I just wanted to mention just before I forget is that um, um, 
there were a couple of things I just wanted to get back to all of you about. The first is um, at the next council meeting, we will be taking up the um, the tab relating to BPOA bargaining. So I know that that was a concern that it would somehow rather, you know, not get the attention it deserved. Um, we will make sure that anything that is remotely bar a bargainable issue will also be added to that tab. And we will be discussing that probably to some degree in executive session with the full council at the next meeting on next Monday. And then the other thing also, Milo had brought up the issue about um, videos of the of these meetings being more readily accessible, not just on the city website. That there is a cost to that. Um, Channel 17 is willing to do that and put that on YouTube, but there is a cost. And um, I think I may have a solution to that to that issue. Um, it'll be something that I will be particularly talking with uh, Zariah about as a member of the Board of Finance to move that as an item that we could possibly use council initiative funds on. It's a fairly small amount. I think you said it was $150. Seems as though there's probably about eight meetings or so. Um, I'll make sure and double check that with you, Jared, and then we'll try to make that, put that on the Board of Finance agenda for next Monday. Um, yes, and I have, uh, Jared, I can, I have the contract to, I meant to share that so I can send that to your attention too, so you can look that over as well. Okay, all the right. The current city contract. Um, okay, um, the minutes. Uh, all three of us are here. Um, uh, there are two minutes, the minutes for February 15th and the minutes for March 8th. Um, I, how I'll, do move to, I'll move to approve the minutes for February 15th. Second. Okay, great. Um, all those in favor of the minutes of um, approving the minutes of February 15th, please say aye. 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 Um, opposed, we are in agreement on that. So we have the minutes of March 15th. Jane, I think you and I were the only two that were at the meeting on March 8th. Are you comfortable making a motion on that? Certainly, um, I would move to approve those minutes. Great, I will second that. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Aye, um, and I assume Sarai you'd prefer to not vote on that. I prefer to not vote on that. And I also don't see them attached to board docs. Oh, really? Okay. You sent them to us, Jared. So that's how I read yeah, them. I Are thought that Thomas had posted them. I apologize. I'll make sure that gets done. I'll try to do it tonight. Okay. Um, is there a concern? Um, is there a concern, Jared, about us voting on something that has not been publicly posted? Yeah, that's probably best that we hold off. And I'll get them posted, and then we'll uh, I'll revisit that next week and on the agenda if that's okay. Okay, all right. I apologize. No worries. Thanks for letting us know. Go ahead, Zariah. Yeah, and then the only thing I was going to say was for the discussion next Tuesday, if we could do six, seven, and nine, um, just so that we can do eight in its entirety, that might be nice. Great. Excellent. Yeah, there's only five in section nine. So, okay. Um, we'll get, we will get the, the rest of the matrix posted, hopefully in the next day or so. Um, and then um, any work that can be done on getting that, um, any uh, responses and notes, if they can go to Thomas and Jared by noon on Monday, next Monday, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, Okay, 724, we are without objection, we're, adjour we're adjourned. Um, thank you all very, very much for your time. Enjoy the rest of your evening and uh, I'll see you next Tuesday, if not before. Good night. Have a good evening. And everyone. Good seeing you all, have a good night. Thanks, Bye. you too.